All right, chapter 38 is when we get to see when the world is very bipolar. Divided between two camps of mighty titans, the un the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc, each you know, each led by the United States and the Soviet Union respectively. So, this was truly a class of a clash of civilizations as you had Western European nations, capitalistic and democratic institutions, as well as some non most decidedly non-democratic allies aligned with the US. While Eastern European nations, communists and authoritarian, were forced to align the USSR. Ideology was very important, but, as, but we must also understand the role of geopolitics, the quest for hegemony. As a result, you get a lot. Of, you get both sides supporting like de uh, leaders who did not subscribe totally to their ideologies. They just didn't like the other side. Moreover, especially on, moreover, moreover, you know. Moreover, particularly of the U.S., many of these allies were morally questionable and dubious. But of course, you know, oh, but of course the Soviets were certainly no better. Europe was split between, so basically, at the, at the end of the Second World War, Europe was effectively split between East and West, Germany again, is the same thing, and Berlin the same thing. We can see that in this nice little map, Germany is just balkanized and stripped of our, ter stripped of our territories in Prussia. As well as the fact that Berlin has also been balkanized furthermore. So in 1948, the Western powers, the US, UK, and France, decided to merge their free occupation zones into West Germany. In response, the Soviets blockade land routes to West Berlin. However, the Allies, however, the Western Allies respond with 11 months of air shipments to Berlin, beginning in June of 1948. The British and the U.S. also embargo Soviet and Soviet, and Soviet bloc exports. The Soviets relent, lifting the blockade in summer of 1949. That, and the Easterns, but but you know this had pretty much, but this pretty much, but this had pretty much marked the beginning of the status quo for the next several decades. With the Eastern sector, with the Eastern sector of Ger Eastern sector of Germany becoming the G the GDR or German Democratic Republic, and the Western sector becoming the Federal Republic of Germany. So. Between 1949 and 1961, you had 3.5 million East Germans fleeing to the West, particularly younger, highly skilled workers. They did this because, at some point, East German conditions, living conditions sucked. Communism is terrible for your living standard and your economy. This led to an intolerable brain drain. So the so the East Germans and Soviets said, screw this, we're building a wall separating East and West Berlin, not Germany. That would have been a very long wall. It was, it was instead a border fence. The reason why they did with Berlin was because of the fact that West, Ger West, Western, West Berlin was a Western ex enclave deep in the heart of East Germany. Thus, an East German could escape to West Berlin and board a flight to West Germany, thus, escaping, thus leaving East Germany forever. The Berlin Wall became a symbol of oppression and failure during the Cold War for communism, however. NATO forms in 19... We also get the beginning. We also have the arms race, NATO forming in 1949, and the Warsaw Pact forming in 1955. Both sides begin to create very large arsenals of nuclear and conventional weapons. To President Dwight D. Eisenhower, this was a cost effect. This was a cost saving measure, but to the USSR, it was about status, especially considering the fact that, like I said before, communism isn't great for your great for your living standard. So, thus, the USSR had to compensate with. With military, with extremely large military spending in terms of percentage of their GDP, by the end of the 1960s, as a result, you get the you get this uh, you know almost uh, you know invisibly agreed on status quo known as mutually assured destruction, in which both sides had so much firepower that they could just wipe each other off the face of the map and thus not win a war. As a result, the United States and the Soviet Union preferred to you preferred to. Uh, Preferred to, you know, wage their wage their struggle for proxy wars, espionage, and intrigue. We can see, you know, you know, as a result of this, these large arsenals, you had in many places in the U.S. labeled with this fallout, ominous fallout shelter label. An example of these proxy wars, as I mentioned before, was Korea. Korea was divided along the 38th parallel after the Second World War. The two superpowers, however, could not agree on unification, and no vote was ever taken. So by 1948, you had effectively two Koreas, with the staunchly anti-communist Republic of Korea, or South Korea, with its capital in Seoul, now, and the Communist People's, Demo Pe Communist People's Democratic Republic of Korea in or North Korea in Pyongyang, it's the capital of Pyongyang. Now, 
Just, now, as we know, North Korea is awful. You know, it's a terrible place to live. Well, it was a terrible place to live, and it still is. But we also remember that South Korea was far from democratic. The president, Sigma, the first president, Sigmund Rhee, was a was a start was a staunch reactionary and a and an iron fist and an iron fisted tyrant who would later be ousted by his own people. So, the Korean War kicks off in 1950 when North Korea launches a surprise invasion that nearly succeeds because the North Koreans were given lots of, you know, Soviet military hardware. Truman, the U.S., and the United Nations immediately respond. The U.S. managed to drive the North Koreans back to the 30th parallel, then go on to capture Pyongyang and approach the Yalu River. This, however, would prove to be an, over, an overstep as China would enter a war pushing the U.S. back. This, however, this prompts basically turns the Korean War into a seesaw war, in which you know you have, for example, Seoul being captured and recaptured four times. You know, in the in the midst of the ceasefire, uh, seesaw, three million are killed before the ceasefire. By the time the ceasefire comes around in the summer of 1953, this effect the war becomes a stalemate as the border between North Korea and South Korea is you know roughly around the 30th parallel. No peace, no peace treaty was ever signed, and tensions continue to abate to this day. This was a characteristic of a Cold War: localized conflicts and proxy wars being used by super the two superpowers to leverage to leverage go to leverage gain political gain now in order to in order to counter communism the soviet the us decided to employ the strategy of containment they would form you know other mini natos like cedo and sento this was all motivated by the domino theory which which set which you know which would actually move eisenhower to consider nuclear weapons nuclear weapon usage in Korea. The theory stated that basically if one communist if one country fell to communism, its neighbors would then fall and then do their neighbors would fall and just become a cascading chain of reactions like a domino, like a chain of dominoes. It would later be discredited and be a, as a like really terrible idea as it would lead to US oversteps such as Vietnam. However, for the time the domino theory made for, made, for the time, however for a time the domino theory seemed to be the most prevalent way of thinking. And as a result, the U.S. would extend this, would extend this, would extend their containment policy to Latin America and Africa. Now, we see this example with Fidel Castro, with Fidel Castro in Cuba. He would overthrow the corrupt U.S. supported supported uh, government of Valencio Batista. Now, I'm not gonna, now I'm not saying now Castro is no angel, but neither was Batista. He was a, he was corrupt and tyrannical. Again, an example of the fact that the U.S., let's just say, has a, just like the Soviet Union, although you could argue not as much, or maybe just as much, I don't know, uh, would support cruel, cruel tyrants that not, that often conflict, that, you know, some would often quite often flick, conflict with America's own values. Castro, as a result, anyway, back to this, Castro, as a result, won sympathy from other Latin American states after this 1959 revolution. He seized his businesses and accepted assistance from the USSR. In retaliation, the US imposes a trade embargo, cutting off sugar imports and diplomatic ties. The Soviets step in with massive aid, gaining a, foothold, gaining a communist foothold off US shores. Castro further puts himself in the communist camp by declaring allegiance to communism to communism and Soviet foreign policy in 1960. Kennedy and the CIA, and the CIA will have none of like will not have any of this, so they send 1,500 Cubans into Bay of Pigs to spur the revolution. But this fails catastrophically when American air support fails to arrive. This becomes a huge um, U.S. black eye, particularly in Latin America, a region that has historically seen American overreach, and would elevate and strengthen Castro's popularity in. Cuba, Latin America, and the world. It also led to Cuba, however, Castro's decision to accept Soviet nukes. So this is, you know, a picture of Fidel Castro at the Bay of Pigs. As you can see, he is, you know, determined. As you can see, we can see him, you know, determined, but also very confident after his victory at Bay of Pigs. So, so on October of 1962, now the Cuban Missile Crisis was one of the closest instances that the U.S. came, that the U.S. and the Soviet Union came to full-blown nuclear war. In October of 1962, the Soviets began assembling missiles in Cuba. The Soviets wanted to gain influence in Latin America and increase their diplomatic leverage with the U.S. Again, they publicly challenged the USSR and quarantines Cuba, implementing blockades to prevent Soviet shipping to prevent Soviet to prevent Soviet ships from delivering miss to, from delivering missile components. At first, it becomes a tense standoff as the Americans wonder, will the Soviets stop at our blockade or will they start bypass or will they just bypass it and at that point willing to fire at them? But luckily, the Soviets concede 
but the U.S. but in exchange, the U.S. guarantees non-interference of the Castro regime. They also make a secret agreement that the U.S. would remove missiles from Turkey. Again, another reason why the Soviets decided to put missiles in Cuba in the first place as kind of a retaliatory measure. You know, as U.S. Secretary of State Don Rusk would say, you know, pub this was basically this little quote by uh, the Secretary of State Don Rusk summarizes it quite nicely, at least what it looked like in the public eye. Public eye. Uh, the public's eye. In reality, it was much more different, a bit more complicated. Eyeball to eyeball, the Soviets were the first to blink. The blink first. Like I said, this was the this was the one moment. This was one of the few moments where the world was actually close to ending itself. So this is a map. This is a you know, you know, a, like one of the you know you can find a lot of these maps online. But this is one a map depicting you know you know the the two blocks. The United States and the Soviet Union, the the Western block, you know, the West, you know, the Western bloc and the Soviet Union. Oh, a little thing that's wrong with the map. Uh, it depicts, you know, South America's NATO. Although many South American countries were pro, U were aligned to the U.S. No thanks to all the dictators we put in play, we helped. Um, it's they were never they never joined NATO, and I doubt they ever will now. So, one of the one of the. Uh, one of the domestic effects of the Cold War is this increased paranoia over communism or leftism in general. You have with the you see an example of this in the Second Red Scare with Senator Joseph McCarthy and the House of Un-American Activities Committee, basically you know accusing everyone they anyone they did not like of of or anyone who had some leftist sympathies of being a communist. They also can create blacklists of these so-called suspicious suspicious um, suspicious individuals you also had this was also the era of oppressive conformity such so as the man you know like the man in the gray flannel suit yeah not very fun if you want to, not very fun if you want to change a social order women were pressured to leave the workforce after the second world war they were you know they were basically oppressed by the ideology of leave it to beaver this was you know this you know this almost seemed like an example of domestic containment in a way However, women push back. For example, we can see this an example of the feminist mystique by Betty Friedan. Women would begin to press for more recognition and equality, and they would use rhetoric that you would often see in liberation movements in in um, in parts of the third world, like you know, women's liberation from male colonization. As that's another example of foreign of foreign affairs aff affecting the uh, d U.S. domestic developments. Another. Um, Key component in the another key U.S. development was the civil rights movement. Black nationalism became more prominent throughout the globe with these individuals. Uh, you know, Marcus Garvey, Nkrumah. I think he was the first. I think he was the leader of Ghana, the first African country to gain independence. You know, Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954. Uh, you know, basically outlaws Soviet se outlaws school segregation. Now, you could argue that actually, interestingly, that part of the motivation for this was part of the motivation to start desegregating stuff was the Soviet Union. The Soviets, not totally, you know, quite rightly, would criticize would accuse the U.S. of hypocrisy, and the fact that you know, the Soviet Union would say, uh, you know, you say all these nice things about equality and freedom and justice, and yet you treat your African Americans as second-class citizens, and they would play and they would play this card brilliantly with sub-Saharan African countries. They would basically say to those African countries, why join? Why join the? Why join up with the U.S.? They treat their blacks terribly. What makes you think they'll treat you any better? You also have the influence, you know. You also have Mahatma Gandhi, the influence of Mahatma Gandhi on Martin Luther King Jr. As King, as King would borrow uh, Gandhi's passive resistance strategies. You also see this with you know Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, in 1955. Ghana gets its independence in 1957, which would you know further you know this idea of civil right of black civil rights, even if it was in sub-Saharan Africa. It was still the first country, sub-Saharan African country, to gain its independence from a European power, thus it carried a lot of symbolic weight. Also, um, Linda Bain Johnson enacts the Civil Rights and Voting Act, vote, Civil Rights and Voting Act's laws, which pro which progressed the U.S. very forward. Now, eventually, now eventually, the Western blocs, the Western bloc just won because of you know much better, bigger, faster growing economies. Still, as as planned, economies are only really good for ketchup. After that, they're just they really they can be just a drag. Also, Western countries had plentiful consumer goods, which you know which ensured that people were satisfied. Actually, um, I you know I actually know this funny story from my AP World History teacher uh, to show an example of this, in which 
Uh, everyone who went to the Soviet Union was on a trip to the Soviet Union was advised bring an extra pair of Levi's because you can sell them for a hundred rubles each a buck a piece because the Soviet Union was just that desperately lacking in you know consumer goods like jeans. Now the kitchen debate between Richard Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev would highlight this. You have so much more personal freedom in the West. Now, so now we must acknowledge that the Soviet bloc had technical and military successes, but they had in order to get these, they had to spend twenty-five to forty-five percent of their GNP gross national pro product on defense. As a result, the U.S. would focus, the USSR would focus more on guns instead of butter. Not a very great strategy for a long-term survival plan. You know, as Helmut Schmidt, Helmut Schmidt, a uh, German politician, would write, would note. Uh, the Soviet Union was nothing more of an upper volta of nukes. Upper volta is an old term for Burkina Faso. Another, another example of the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States was the space race, as both sides wanted to claim major technological victories in order to prove themselves as superior. The, the Soviets have initial successes with ICBMs, the first satellite, the first man in space. This scares the U.S. In, into the first big, potentially unconstitutional federal intervention in the schools in the National Defense Education Act. It also scares the U.S. into, into the NASA moon landing mission in 1969, which, you know, that's pretty surprising because Kennedy said, go to the moon in the early 1960s. America fulfills that dream in 1969. So, yeah, you know, America certainly had a lot of strengths there. However, people, some people begin to wonder, is it possible that these... Two superpowers could peacefully coexist, as Khrushchev and noted Iowa. I uh, just ignore this. Well, you will. Well, anyway. However, you know, even even titans suffer from you know v big mishaps. You have mul You would have multiple challenges to superpower hegemony. For example, France leading Western resistance to U.S. dominance, getting their own nukes by 1964, and withdrawing from NATO's command structure. They also pushed for what would later become the EU. Yugoslavia led Eastern resistance to the USSR hegemony and left slash was expelled from the Soviet bloc in 1948. However, most attempts were often crushed. You know, Hungary being cr Hungary, you know, Hungarian resistance being crushed in 56. Same thing with Czechoslovakia in the Prague Spring of 1968. This was all motivated by this was all justified by, by, by the Brezhnev Doctrine, which stated that the that the Soviet Union had the right to invade any socialist country threatened by elements hostile to socialism. Basically, the Soviet version of the Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary, if you want to draw parallels. You also now you also had China becoming a wild card. The civil war between the communists and nationalists would erupt after the defeat of Japan. Within three years, it was apparent that the, it was apparent that the communists were winning. Chiang Kai-shek would be for, would be forced to the island of Taiwan with his nationalist buddies. He would proclaim his government of government as the legitimate government of China while ruling from Taiwan. This was accepted by the West. However, Mao Zedong would later proclaim the uh, People's Republic of China in 1949, and this was accepted by the USSR and communist countries this begins the you know uh, Mao would then launch, initiate a ma dramatic transformation in, of Chinese society in, in the communist mold so these are some of the reforms things that Mao did he concentrated all power into the communist party as ex-nationalists were executed or sent to reform camps he also in initiated a rapid industrialization program under Soviet style five year under Soviet style five year plan in 1955. He also initiated a massive land redistribution program, purging landowners, kind of like what Stalin did. Uh, he also influenced collective farming, which ends up becoming a disaster. Like collective farms in general are a disaster. He also has a universal health care and education. Not bad. Uh, he also gets he does some nice things like banning some gross stuff like child marriage, foot binding, as well as granting women access to divorce and le legalization of abortion. However, he ends up destroying any bit of progress he managed to make with his insane Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. Now... At first, Beijing and Moscow were pretty happy as they were both concerned about the U.S. rehabilitation of Japan. The U.S. Beijing would recognize the primacy of the USSR as the world communist leader. They would return military aid and they would receive military aid in return. The Soviet Union also acted as China's principal trading partner. However, you would also get me, our frictions would appear with mocked over Moscow's neutrality in, in the conflict with India over Tibet, which was claimed by China in 1950. This rift sharpened in 1964 as Khrushchev moves toward peaceful coexistence with the U.S. and China develops nuclear weapons. Basically, China viewed uh, the USSR as just a but they viewed the Soviets as sellouts. Uh, 
you do, you know, you do get something close to peaceful coexistence with detente, a reduction in hostilities between nu the nuclear superpowers. For example, you do strategic arms limitations talks like SALT-1, some cultural students, like some cultural exchanges like students in Leningrad. However, um, the, the time just died eventually. Uh, China and the U.S. would learn to, would start to team up on the USSR and engaging in full diplomatic relations by 1979 with the U.S. cutting off relations with Taiwan. Oops. Um, as well as using ping pong diplomacy. But the biggest, you know, the biggest, you know, wedge between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was the disastrous USSR intervention in Afghanistan in 1979. So... The U.S. Uh, would also would aid a non-communist South Vietnam and South Com South communist. Eh, U.S. would aid a non-communist uh, South Vietnam in after France's humiliating defeat. But this government wasn't very lovely. Um, again, for example, the U.S. supporting unsavory leaders in the pursuit of geopolitics. Again, though, I'm not trying to make the view like the Soviets better. They were. Like probably worse. I think actually they were worse. So, however, this uh, this containment slash dominoes fear thinking was very ignorant of the na of really just the nationalism present in this in the Viet in the North Vietnamese. The Vietnamese really didn't really view it as so much. The North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong really didn't view it as so much as an act as a struggle for communism, but rather a liberation struggle from from imperialism. U.S. troops will eventually reach 500,000 by 1968. President Richard Nixon attempts to end the war by using by using extensive bombing campaigns and invading Cambodia, but that backfires badly when people figure out that he was trying to do it in secret. So he decides to initiate a program of Vietnamization where he will hand over control to South Vietnam. Vietnam. Eventually, you know, the Americans, however, are still clamoring for the end of the war. With even a, you know, for example, Walter Cronkite. I think like I don't know if it was Cronkite, but someone saying you know the center cannot hold. The U.S. gives up in 1973 and you know signed the Paris Peace Treaty. The war would continue until and withdrawing from the war. The war would continue until the South is defeated in 1975. Now the Soviets also experienced their own version of Vietnam and Afghanistan. They would Afghanistan originally was non aligned until 1978, becoming a pro Soviet country under a through a coup. Their radical non-Islamic reforms provoke a backlash. The Soviet Union intervenes and fights a nine-year war, nine-year battle against the Af Afghan Mujahideen. The U.S. supplies ground-to-air stinger missiles and mules, as well as allying with Osama bin Laden. Yes, that bin Laden, the guy who planned the 9-11 attacks. In 1989, the U.S. is forced to give up. However, it really wasn't... The USSR was forced to give up, but it really wasn't a U.S. victory concerning the fact that the Taliban eventually came to power in the ensuing civil war after the Soviets were expelled. Vietnam and Afghanistan overextended the superpowers and exposed the weaknesses of their militaries and state policies. You also had some, you know, um, you know, countercultural protests to the Cold War, like Dr. Strangelove, that would that criticize nuclear power policies, massive anti-Vietnam protests, rock and roll, they, you know. The Watergate, you know, the backlash, the wa Watergate scandal. But eventually, all things must have come to an end. The end of the Cold War began under Ronald Reagan, despite... Now, he himself was a hardline, you know, Cold Warrior. He deeply opposed the USSR, calling it an evil empire. He also promoted fairly massive military spending, you know, beyond the Soviet economy's ability to keep up. This included, like, outlandish strategy, the plans of the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars... However, luckily, Mikhail Gorbachev, Mikhail Gorbachev a uh, reformer, event, managed to come to power and enact some reforms. However, these reforms end up actually bringing down the Soviet Union even faster. He, ch he, did, he did so because he decided to change from the Brezhnev Doctrine to the Sinatra Doctrine, you know, based off the Sinatra, referencing Sinatra's song, My Way, which he basically gave all the, you know, Soviet satellites their own little auto like, autonomy and their own affairs. Is to pre this is... You know, his his ability to get in office was helped by the fact that his two predecessors die in, af in office after one year each. It's really, it's just, you know, fortunate, fortunate fact of history. And as we can see, this is a graph of uh, U.S. defense spending as a percent of GDP. For the most part, it was very small, and then it ballooned in sec the Second World War. And, you know, went down, but remained still fairly large. You know, this was truly the sign of, you know, America, you know, entering onto the world stage. Same thing here. Now, despite Soviet influence, tanks, and Russification policies, nationalism had always 
uh, resisted communist ideology in Eastern, U in Eastern Europe. Paul, the Polish trade union solidarity movement opposes the Polish Communist Party Polish Communist Party and forces multi-party elections in 1989. It also helped with the fact that, Pol that, it, that, that the Catholic Church had a Polish Pope who sympathized with Solidarity and thus supported them, giving them a massive morale boost. Bulgaria, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia and Romania would follow. Most of these guys would do undergo peaceful, like you know, overthrows of communism. But other times you have some, you know, other times you have some really bloody examples like Romania. Gorbachev would eventually tear down the Berlin Wall in 1989, and East and West Germany were reunited in 1990. Now, the reforms under Gorbachev were forced on them due to stagnation. One was perestroika, or economic restructuring, which allowed some limited capitalism. There was also glasnost, or political openness. However, both were too little, too late, and poorly executed. National sentiments, long like long suppressed thanks to russification policies, you know, bubble up to bubble up to the surface. And eventually, you have, you know, several non non Russian republics um, seceding in August of nineteen uh, in August of nineteen ninety one. However, this attempted hardliner coup fails, and the Soviet Union is utterly utterly collapses by the end of nine, of the year nineteen. 1991. Boris Yeltsin will declare Russian independence, and eventually 15 new independent republics will follow. So yeah, this is a map of like just the collapse of the Soviet Union and the European communist regimes. Just yeah, yeah, that's that's just pretty significant because you get all these nice little nice little countries. Now you think, oh yay, communism defeated. You know, um, you know, it should be not all nice and happy. Well, not really. Um, the Cold War had provided a certain comfort in the balance of power. Everything was predictable. Was USSR versus the Soviet Union, USSR versus America. Uh, however, it be however with the with the demise of the you know the quote unquote evil empire, people will begin to wonder, well, do we really need all these security structures like NATO? Um, you know, however, you do have some, you know, you, but you did have criticism of NATO and the Warsaw Pact turned the price for the ability to manage rather than escalate such conflicts. However, the miracle decade of 1991 to 2001 would end with a with the with the unfortunate attacks of September 9, September September 11. And that's all. Thank you.